Yes. I'd like to welcome comrade Jeff Monson. He was a Pac-10 wrestler for Oregon State University. He's a world champion in submiss in submission wrestling, a world jujitsu champion. Uh, because of this, he's very well known in the UFC and MMA world. But in our circles, he's known as a comrade, a true fighter for international for the international proletariat. And that's why we're glad he's with us. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Glad to be here. Um, so first, uh, I want to sort of split this up into two sections. So we're going to have sort of more about your career, your wrestling, your, your fighting, and then we'll move to sort of your political development, your move to Russia and stuff like that. So First, okay. could you just give us a brief introduction to your wrestling career uh, in high school and then in college as well? Well, uh, yeah, I started wrestling in high school um, as a freshman, and I love sport so much. And really, um, my passion was baseball. Um, and I did I did football as well, but my passion was baseball. And uh, I, I but I love sports, so I wanted um, a fall. Um, a, a winter sport yeah winter sport um to kind of do something in sport so i didn't know what i was doing i think they had swimming and basketball and wrestling during the winter in high school and i was like i was gonna actually try out for basketball which i wasn't really good at it was probably my least sport i was best at but um but I forgot my shoes. I forgot my basketball shoes. So the first day is like, man, I might, I mean, I'm already, you know, short. I'm, you know, it's not that good at basketball. So I'm like, I'm going to have a hard time with basketball. Yep. So I just, I just went out for wrestling because it was like right there. And they had, I think uh, they let uh, like the people, like they had old wrestling shoes you could wear, you know, for, I did that for the first couple of days. So it just it was by by luck. So I guess I wrestled in high school. Um, had a real tough time. Uh, I came like quite a like OCD and had like an eating disorder problem my second year, and like lost literally the whole year of school. Like barely um, had to take some like extra classes and stuff just to pass because I lost like thirty five pounds, like vomiting, all this stuff, trying to make like a lower weight and become like obsessive and crazy. Um and so I came back my junior year and was like I wasn't vomiting anymore, but like I'd lost a year of my life and I was not the same person and um physically. So I didn't have a good year. And finally senior year I did pretty good. Went to state, but didn't do anything there. And but I now I was obsessed kind of in a different way like so it's like to win and um so i started like going to like summer camps going to all the tournaments i could do i walked on to oregon state um and then like i finally my third year i got a scholarship to oregon state and won the pack 10s and then my senior year actually the coach at oregon state went to illinois and i followed him there at that point during the summer i'd gotten married and I went there and to Illinois where I had my first child and um, I did okay. You know, I went to nationals the second time and, and did okay. But I still, when I finished, I was still, you know, like unfulfilled, like uh, sports wise. So I, um, so I always had this dream, you know, I joined, I did some jujitsu and in, in uh, Minnesota when I was going to grad school and went to a bunch of tournaments, went to like the U S open tournaments, like in wrestling a bunch of years and almost placed a few times, like three times. I kind of, that was my dream. If I had like placed in the top six to be on like the national team, um, I think I would have been, I think I would have been happy at that point, but I never, I came close. I never did, but I was like, you know, at this point I had two kids, a family, a where I was working 40 hours a week and going to school full time and trying to compete at the same. So, and I was doing really well against guys who were like living in Colorado Springs at the Olympic training center, like yep. 12 months a year. I was doing, you know, I was right at that level, but just like a little bit short every time. So it's frustrating. So I moved back to Washington state where I'd gone to high school and, um, 
guy became a psychologist working with mentally ill people, working with um, like children, doing counseling. And I still just had this dream and I was able to um, not wrestle because there was like no, like hardly any wrestling. There was no college programs, nothing. I was just like kind of working out with like high school kids and stuff. And then, but then um, like MMA, we started being big. We had Randy Couture who won the UFC title, Marie Smith who won the UFC title, Josh Barnett who won the UFC title, um, Chael Sonnen, like uh, Matt Lindland who won the Olympics or the, uh, silver in the Olympics and fought for the UFC title. So we had all these guys like right in my neighborhood, like doing this. And, and I started training with these guys. They're all nice guys, all had wrestling backgrounds. So it was like, uh, it was kind of a match made in heaven. So then I went to Abu Dhabi for the, my first time out of the USA and won the world championship, like out of nowhere. <laughs> um, here I couldn't like place, you know, in the top six in the USA. Um, but I was able to do this like more, you know, I had guys like really tough guys to train with and had the right coaches and had everything. And then all of a sudden, bam, I just, you know, won the world championship. And then, um, wow. you know, and that, that just, that's my career started then, like from that point. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's a great rundown. And so what, what drove you to switch to MMA? Do you, th um, do you think it's, it's more you sort of peaked in wrestling. You didn't see any, you know, further opportunities. And why do you think wrestlers tend to make the switch to UFC and MMA? I mean, I think I'll answer that part first. I mean, I think rest because it's like um, there's money. You can make a living. Um, it's more notoriety. It's big. I mean, you know, in, 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 in Russia here, if you're Olympic champion, it's a big, 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 big deal in rest, but especially wrestling because they love it. Like, like all the schools here that where I teach at these schools and do this stuff, like they all have wrestling, either Greco-Roman or freestyle wrestling, like in, in the program at school, the after school activities, but, and, and that's a big deal. And in USA, it's like, if you're Olympic champion wrestler, it doesn't, like, you could be Olympic champion badminton, like in the right. USA, it was the difference you know what i mean unless unless you're like a gymnast and on the cover of a wheaties box or something like that or like it doesn't some, carry the same weight as it does in russia and so these guys these wrestlers i think you know what if i went i go to the olympics that's that's the end of the rope you know there's nothing left you know and there's no there's no professional wrestling league where i can earn money or earn a living so the right. best bet to um you know mma like they're seeing all these these wrestlers and they you know a lot a lot of wrestling a lot of the stuff transfers over to uh fighting you know the takedowns the um the hard work that you're already a good athlete you know if you're you're olympic level you're a great athlete already and you're you know it's like you're you, you have a leg up you really do have a leg up on these guys that are just like maybe high school or college like athletes not at the high level and they're like oh i want to do mma and learn how to box and jujitsu and stuff like that and all of a sudden they're really good in the mma but um a, a olympics caliber or that level wrestler has a really big advantage i think and and i think they can see that um so, for me i, I got yeah. into it just because um it was because it was because it was like a nightmare for me really like yeah like was a night i didn't like fighting i didn't like like i'd never been in fight price since i was seven years old i didn't like like that kind of stuff and for me it was just like a challenge that i didn't really want to do but i couldn't turn away from it you know like don't look into the light but i had to and kind of one of those things mm -hmm. um and then once i fought the my very first fight after that i was kind of like okay i i, I gotta do it i can't I can't step away because it's like I have the opportunity to fight. It's my best chance to. I wasn't even thinking about career at this point. I wasn't thinking about making money. My I for my first, I did like fifteen at least fifteen to twenty, probably fifteen amateur fights for zero before I ever like fought fought. In my first fight, I probably made like one hundred seventy five bucks because it's oh. in Canada. I didn't, make, I didn't make nothing, so it wasn't. It wasn't. I didn't think it was something to do i was still working as a as a counselor so i didn't think it was something that it was gonna ever lead into being like a full-time job so gotcha 
So what do you think makes uh, some succeed and others fail in that switch? Is it is it drive or a particular attribute? Is it attitude? Is it, it what do you think makes some wrestlers successful in that transition and others um, not so successful? Um, I mean, I think a lot a lot of it is, I mean, they already got the work ethic. So that's like half of it. Um, it's, it's hard, man. I like, uh, some people just are not designed to get hit <laughs> or to hit other yeah. people. It's like, they can't, you know, I mean, Dan Severin, who was actually, who actually did win the UFC, like way, way, way back. Then, I think maybe the first UFC champ or heavyweight champ, um, you know, like being hit, like he never learned in his whole career. He never learned how to box. He never learned how to defend himself from box or getting kicked and everything. He just didn't like it. He just was a wrestler. And, um, of course, these days, being this mixed martial arts, you have to be pretty, like, okay at everything. But some guys just don't get to that level. And they need to be, um, you know, like uh, Henry um, Cujo. I think I'm pronouncing his name wrong. Um, Cujo, whatever. He won Olympic gold, won the UFC title. Like, he's, like, on top of the world. Like, he, he was, like, one of the best examples of making that transition successfully you know he was able to yeah. um use all of his all the tools that he had for wrestling and 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 then expand on them you know it's like it's hard and also um you brought up it's hard to be really really good at something be like a, like a top level wrestler ncaa wrestler olympic style wrestler whatever and then to go back and go you know what i i gotta learn how to box i gotta learn jujitsu i gotta learn to defend kicks and maybe to kick and i it's like you're starting from scratch like you might have a good work ethic and have be a good athlete but you're learning like like you're having guys that are been doing this that aren't nearly maybe the athlete you are not nearly as experienced even competitively do you like kicking your ass in practice because they know how to box and they know how to do this and it's some guys just can't can't deal with going backwards when they're they've reached like a high level and they've they're used to success like you have to get beat in the room maybe not in that maybe not in your contest but you have to get beat up for a while and not do well and 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 not be successful and you know go home from practice going oh my gosh and and that i think that's for sure the biggest reason why some people are not successful because they just can't accept taking a step backwards and starting from scratch and in, in a sport that they're not as good at as wrestling gotcha gotcha so did you train year round or did you take breaks and did that change in between wrestling and MMA and jujitsu and, you know, everything? Well, once I started um, doing MMA and jujitsu, like in probably 1997, um, I just like, I trained all year round, but it, you know, it was like maybe one day I'd lift weights. Maybe one day I would run on the track. Maybe one day, I go into practice because my, you know, like my friend Dennis Hallman or something would be there. So we'd train jujitsu together. Um, maybe I'd go, I'd down, go down to Portland once a week and work out with Randy Kutcher and Chael Sonnen and Matt Linlin. Maybe like once a week I'd go up to Seattle, train with Josh Barnett and Marie Smith. Um, so it was just, it was, it was consistent. But uh, like every week, I couldn't say like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, doing this. It was like every day. Like I, I think I'll do this today, kind of thing. But I, you know, I did, I did work out hard, but it was just all the time. I remember I had like a, I had a full time job as a as a counselor, and I was also you know a dad. So, um, but I didn't. It didn't stop me from working out. Got you. Got you. Um, so who do you idolize for, for each sport, for wrestling, for, for boxing, for jujitsu? Do you have idols in each or is it, is it one guy or who are your influence? Um, I don't, you know, I, I wouldn't say I idolize anybody. Um, like probably Randy was a big, like, like I, I would think that's a better word. Like you said, influence. I, I think he was a big influence on me because um I remember when he won the UFC title that night, I watched when he, he actually beat Marie Smith, who's also from Seattle. Um, and I remember, I still remember that night, you know, what I did, everything like that. And I, and that, that like, I was like, after he won, I'm like, man, like two years ago or three, two or three years ago, 
I was in the same division of him in wrestling at the NSA championships. Like, you know what I mean? We were almost, we almost competed against, we could have competed against each other if mm -hmm. we had been messed up. And now he's the UFC champion. So I go, I'm, you know, I can be at this level. I mean, I could be, I could, this is something I can do. And, um, you know, I know, I knew I had good coaches around me. I had um, Matt Hume up in Seattle. I had, I had some good guys, some good training partners and stuff. So I knew I could be, I mean, Randy being one of them, I knew I had good training partners. So that was like, he's probably the, the biggest influence as far as um, sport as, as, uh, as I, as I could have. So. Okay. Um, so this is a, uh, more of a question for my brother directly, who was, yep. I will admit, the better wrestler in the family. I will admit that uh, full, full stop. So he said, what should I be aware of as a new father to do or not to do to get my son into wrestling so that he enjoys it, but doesn't feel pressure or get burnt out? That's a good question. Um, I, I, would, I, I think that like one thing is like half him like go with him to practice to practices stuff like that like i don't know does your brother still wrestle or does he practice does he teach yeah he he um he he so i from what i'm aware he did still will do some walk-ons um at certain colleges he definitely huh. he wrestled in college um but now i think most of it is 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 in the rear view mirror but he definitely wants to get his kid involved his kid's only uh two or three uh two so it's still okay. got some time i mean i would i would bring him to some practices when he does go sometimes even if even if mom comes to to kind of watch him a little bit just so he gets just just he gets exposed to it just exposed to it but the big i think the big thing is just have him to go to some practices make the practices short like 30 minutes make sure it doesn't stay longer um it's fun. They do a lot of activities and they shouldn't be, you know, they're, they're learning and they should always have games at the end and stuff like that. And then also uh, very important, like he does other sports, he swims, he plays soccer, he, whatever he's interested, or maybe, okay, we're going to try this, whether he likes, wants to or not, because he doesn't, you know, two or three is know what he likes yet. So right. you make him do different sports and then, um, and then see, kind of see what he likes, you know, but, um, if you make a sport fun, obviously, and not competitive, not win or losing, that kind of thing, then, you know, I think they'll tend to like it. So, yeah, they got, but you're right. I mean, your brother's right on saying, like, I want him to like it because he's been, I, I made that mistake with my, my, t my 10 year old now, she's 10. Mm -hmm. I had her when she was seven. I was bringing her, she didn't want to go and I was bringing her, bringing her. And I was yeah. so proud. She was like being tough and tough, but she just hated it. And I, at some point it's like, you know, I'm not, I, I wasn't doing it for me. I wasn't doing it. I was, I was doing it for her, but can't make her do something she doesn't want to do. So. Right. That makes a lot of sense. That's a good answer. A good answer. Um, um, so now I want to sort of get to your, to your transition in ideology or, or, you know, philosophy and your move to the Soviet Union. So, or to, to Russia, not the Soviet yeah. Union anymore. Uh, so when and where did your interest uh, in Russia or the Soviet Union, whichever one it was, where did it come from and when did it come into being? I mean, I guess I was always interested in, in Russia or the Soviet Union when I was younger, um, when it was the Soviet Union, just because, you know, films, propaganda, I really liked history. I was always interested in history. And so, you know, I was like a go USA guy, go, you know, support us in the Olympics, support, you know, US or whatever. And um, it was, I always had an interest in it, but they always wanted, of course, to go, but I hadn't traveled anywhere until 1999 when I went to Abu Dhabi for the World Championship of Jiu Jitsu for the first time. Um, but my first time here in 2011 um, in Russia was like exactly like I envisioned. You know, I saw Red Square, I saw Lenin's you know, my, uh, tomb, I saw like all the stuff. People acted dressed exactly how I saw in the movies. So it was nothing new. It's only when I started coming here more that I saw russia for more than it was but um 
I can I can point to two specific incidences in time where I became political, if you want to call it that. Um, one time I was, I was in college, a senior in college at University of Illinois, and I was, you know, psychology major, and, and we had a um, professor, a guest professor come in from India, and it was a social psychology class. And I don't know how we got on the subject, but we started talking about um, how money was, how money being spent on individual therapy is better spent on group therapy, how it would go longer, how this, and that led to uh, money being spent that US tax dollars going to war, going to this instead of, you know, and then and they go, no, US, well, I remember a student saying, oh, the US, you know, we aid all these countries, we aid all these poor countries. And yeah. uh, this professor goes, no, like all this aid is tied to something it's tied to us allowing military bases there it's a tied to like uh, companies coming in and like uh taking over their utilities or taking over their you know specific uh um you know privatizing their resources and you know the more i learned about it, it's like i walked out of that like just like whoa like <laughs> like everything i thought about the you like like America and, and, and like the economic system. And this was like completely turned upside down. So I just started reading a little bit more and becoming more, I was definitely wasn't political, but I was becoming more interested in it. Um, in 1999, when I actually won the world championship and I came back, I came back to see, I was living in Olympia near Seattle and I flew in right in the middle of the WTO protests, like right when that was going on. And I remember like, thinking like what's all this about like or like what's going on here and um so i became interested in it, you know listen to like the pro I, you know i had talked to some protesters from olympia and what they're thinking some some guys that from the iww that were also yep. like and what how they got involved in it and what was going on and so now i i started having like some opinions and you know change even though i wasn't very educated in the subject um and then the turning point for me was um, shortly thereafter, I went to Brazil and I had a fight in Brazil in Rio de Janeiro, like one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And I won my fight and I was feeling like so good. I, and it was like two, three o'clock in the morning, maybe probably three, three o'clock in the morning. And I went walking down to the beach. I think I, I just was in flip flops and a tank top and a shorts, just like I want my fight, I want like the beautiful thing. It's warm, it's beautiful, and I, I'm just like feel good. And I'm I'm walking back to this probably four star hotel, like really nice. They had a like a midnight buffet and all this. I was going back ready to like to like eat. Got there was like all night. You know, you could you could eat all night. And I was walking back, and as I approached the my hotel, I saw this woman. She was on a a box like a, a flattened out cardboard box that they broke down and with her she had i don't know maybe like three years old boy and a maybe seven or eight year old daughter and i was walking up the show right outside the hotel i was walking up and the daughter the girl ran up to me and asked me for my a rio i mean it was like the equivalent of about 30 american cents at that point 33 american cents at that point i'm like mm -hmm. wow and um so i went in you know, i gave him some money and i went up to this room and i'm like i went in the hotel room and i looked down and i didn't see him anymore i was like trying to look out the window but i where i was in the room wasn't at that angle so i couldn't see him but i was and i thought what like i'm a i fight i fight for a living and i'm in a four-star hotel and here's a woman with two children and these children obviously have made never made any decisions in their life to put them in the situation and they're two three in the morning begging for money to to eat like living like living on a cardboard box outside with no shelter with their mom and i'm like like this is this there's something wrong with there's something wrong mm -hmm. and um that like that night i became political like that literally I delved into books, re like research marks and um, like, you know, like, mm -hmm. like not many books. Uh, there was a, 
there's a bookstore, you know, Olympia and, and Seattle is a good place if you want to be political. Um, and, um, and I, so I went all over the place, like looking for like, I, I got books. I talked to people. I joined the IWW. Um, I went on some protests that I felt strongly about. It wasn't just protests and protest. Like if I felt strongly about it, I, you know, I went. And um, so then it, it just like developed for more. And then I think the more I learned, um, the more I realized what I didn't know. And the more I realized that I didn't know before and the more like ashamed I got for the way I had been for so long and not knowing, you know, it was like, for me, it's like the analogy of from the matrix, like taking the red pill. Like it really just, the whole world opened up and it was completely different than I expected. And now it, the, my, it's difficult for me. Um, when I talk to people, like, like even today, right. I, I, I write posts and stuff like this. And some people like arguing about capitalism and this, it's like, mm -hmm. like it's really hard for me not to be like, like angry and pissy about it. Like saying, man, are you kidding me? Like, this is not yeah. like, but I have to remember I was, I was that way too, you know, not, it was a while ago, but you know, I was, I was a, an adult and I was still thinking the same way. So um, I, I feel blessed and lucky that I got the opportunity to travel um, and that I, I was just put in situations. I had that one professor that one day in college, and I think just some things opened the doors for me that gave me the opportunity. And I just got to think, you know, I don't know these people's lives and I don't know what opportunity, if they've even had these opportunities to, you know, I mean, just look at the media. I mean, what the media says and this, you know, when I travel, I go to Japan, I remember going to Japan for the first time and I, I was reading like uh, an international newspaper and I just couldn't, I was shocked by the difference in it. It was like an internet, it wasn't for Japan. It wasn't for the United States. It was just like international said, uh, the president of the United States went to this. This was what was talked about. It was like all just facts, like yeah. this happened. Yeah. It wasn't like, no, like, you know, it, if you look at a newspaper, like the New York times or any other, which is, fairly left um, compared to some of the other ones but if you look at some of the newspapers they're so it's like an editorial but you don't realize it it's like you read something about oh you know um president trump went this and he tried to get the united like but it's it's telling you what they want you to to feel and think so you 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 read something and it's like you already have your opinion because it's their opinion that they want you to have and you don't you don't even realize it you think it's you think it's like uh, like from just facts, but it's not. You have to read something that's like completely different. Anyway, the point is I've had these opportunities. So, um, you know, I feel really fortunate that I was able to um, have a career where I was able to, you know, find out this. So I think that was one of the most important parts of my fighting career really is to give me the opportunity to um, see the world, you see other cultures, see other points of view and to learn about the world. I think that's really good because you know, one thing that we don't really appreciate or realize, especially when we're young and very few of us actually grow to realize it when we're older is we are at the heart of empire. We really are like in every possible way, America is the heart of empire. And I think that also gets to the things you were saying about the times and the media is like every empire has its sort of, um, I don't know if you ever read Gramsci, but like hegemonic sort of influences and hegemony is this concept that I do want to discuss, you know, uh, sometime, uh, sometime down the road, but it, it it's sort of this concept of like the irrational fear of a very good idea or like um, just sort of this framing that you were sort of laying out with the times, like it's, it's framing a w something so it's pretty hard to disagree with it. You know what I'm saying? Um, even if that framing is dishonest, even if it's misleading and stuff like that. And I think it's just good for us as leftists to, to, to get out into the world, to, to get out of the heart of empire. And because this should be a, an international movement, you know, this is the international workers of the world, you know, the, this isn't, uh, you know, the American progressives or whatever, you know. Uh, so I thought that was, that was very interesting about, you know, going international and being able to to experience different people's perspectives and, and stuff like that. Um, so when did you end up moving to the to Russia? 
Um, so I started coming in 2011. Okay. And I was okay. kind of coming off and on. Um, and I had like, uh, you know, I met uh, President Putin. I met some, you know, high influential people, this and that. And um, so I, you know, I was on Dancing with Stars here, like on the comedy club, like all their big on their like late night shows, this and that. I uh, had some more fights. Um, and so they just it just kind of blew up. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I, and I really, I mean, I, I liked history, like I said. And so for me, this, this place has a special significance because this is the place where the only social revolution in the world ever like took place. So I have like a kind of a deep respect and um, you know, the people, the people here are still um, like, I mean, a lot of them miss, I miss communism, especially the, the older people, they miss communism. And some, some of the younger people are um, kind of getting disenfranchised with the, the system now. So they're like looking yeah. at, yeah. So, look at us, so, yeah. So actually I, I, I did have some, some questions about that. It does seem to me, um, Oh, are you still there? Yeah. You're good. Yeah. Okay. Um, it did seem to me that, that when, you know, I've seen videos of just sort of people asking different Russians about, about the Soviet union. Um, and it does seem like there's a lot a lot more sympathy with the older folks who actually experienced the Soviet Union. I had uh, someone who's in my sort of distant family. He's my um, my mom's uncle's daughter's husband or something like that. <laughs> and and he lived in the Soviet Union in in East Germany, and he said it's the most safe he's ever felt in his life. Yeah, and. Um, yeah. So, so do you do you see that trend where the younger people who didn't get to experience the Soviet Union are much more pro-capitalist, and the the older folks are maybe more sympathetic to the Soviet project? Yeah, I mean, obviously the the older people who are, I mean, that says something because the older people, you know, before 1991, um, they lived in that system and they're living in this system, so they they're the ones to ask because they mm -hmm. lived in both. So you can say, okay, how did you like living there? How did you like living here? And um, obviously there was some good things about, you know, living in the Soviet, Soviet Union and, and some negative things as well. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the, yeah, the younger generation hasn't, there's only one thing to compare it to. Um, but there is, there's a new kind of um, movement or more than a movement. It's, it's a, a feeling with like younger, younger people that, that, that have some, um positive feelings towards you know their country and and the soviet union and stuff and they just um you know the opportunity i think maybe the you know their parents or their parents parents are telling them about you know the, the opportunities and stuff like that that they had available to them before that are not available now you know um and it's it's i mean say which one is capitalism you know it's capitalism right. that's 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 the problem and um yeah um you know and obviously the soviet union had had its problems as well you know but the big problem right. started when they started like embracing some um you know capitalistic you know philosophies and and entering you know like gorbachev and mm -hmm. and uh, you know and i i like i have to say like, the biggest traitor the biggest i think should be lynched <laughs> like ever was was born gelson like he 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 sold this country piece by piece to the the oligarchs, you know, and it took they, they still haven't recovered, you know. It's been a slow they they recovered it, you know, somewhat, but um, you know, this kind of sold it to rich people, like we're really like the land, the resources to rich people, and um, he was a weak leader, alcoholic, and um, like mm -hmm. very like, influenced by the wealthy, and he just. You just let it go you know it's like it's pretty sad so i mean i don't know if you know this but um i just actually read they had a referendum um for each of the of the soviet republics um before the soviet union broke up and it was like do you want to have like keep the soviet union or like have a different girl have have a what they have now have like a capitalistic right. and um 
it was 78% voted to keep the Soviet Union. Seven, like overall, like the like some of the states like Latvia, Estonia, whatever voted out. But right. most like most states, when you took all the things together, like I think only like four of the republics, four or five, five, five of the republics voted out. And the rest of them wanted to stay in by like a huge, huge margin. It wasn't close. Um, but the, the leader, you know, um, Yeltsin, they, they did what they wanted anyway. So it, it's it's quite sad, really. You're very good at leading me into my next question. So your answers are very good at leading up to what I'm going to ask next. But really quick, I wanted to just say, you know, like as an American, um, you know, leftist but i don't feel like that's sort of sufficient anymore because even liberals think they're on the left here uh, but like you know socialist communist you know whatever i i do believe that capitalism is is bad and that it should be abolished and that it's exploitation um but but you know a lot of people have troubles with me when i do defend the soviet union and and kind of what i say is is look we can clearly look at some negatives of what happened in the Soviet Union, we can, but but we can also look at a lot of, a lot of positives, which is something that America, especially our history books, do not ever mention. No. Um, and and the thing is, is like whatever what I tell people is like whatever you think about the Soviet Union and the Soviet project, the one thing you can say is it's the only place in the world where workers have successfully overthrown the oligarchs to to the extent that you actually it can they've gone the farthest towards a socialistic society they, out, they they took out the monarchy you know they they threw out the czar right. so i mean they did overthrow i mean they just unfortunately that that power vacuum that was left um that both the bolsheviks took over you know and their of course their whole their whole ide ideology was we're going to take over we're going to eventually give it back to the people, you know, over time, but it just, it just never happened. The opposite happened. They took, you know, they took more yeah. control. And, um, and, and we also, we also should be real about why those things happen in, in some socialist systems. It's because when you're, when you're constantly under attack by capital, it's extremely hard to trust anybody or just function as a real leader of any country because, you know, the whole world's kind of against you. Uh, you don't have much, you know, sort of political prowess that capitalist states have, you know. Didn't America, I believe, send troops to fight against the, the Red Army uh, during yeah, yeah. the Revolutionary War, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. During the during this yeah during the Russian Civil War, they they did they sent they were they were actually fighting the Russians because mm -hmm. they don't want they don't want a socialist you yeah. know government. So yeah, and it, so it's like who who deserves to be scared of who who here you know on the world stage when we when it comes to power dynamics and I thought that was all really good stuff that you brought up and sort of cements what I think about you know, the Soviet Union, you know, I, I'm still learning about this stuff. And I'm still learning about the history of the Soviet Union. And we'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, but yeah, I just always thought, look, it's, there's always experiments at the beginning of social change. There's yeah. and Soviet Union was the most prominent example of an attempt at a socialist society. And we need yeah. to take the lessons that went well, and the lessons that didn't go well, and move forward with them instead of just saying nope it's bad write it off we don't want anything to do with it as the left because that's that's not what we should look at any country as but specifically the soviet project which is which is our our, our biggest project really i mean i when i talk to people because i hear this from all the time from america my friends my family <laughs> I'm like man why do you like it why do you why do you like it there? why do you why are you so like want to go you know why do you want or like this communist idea and this i'm like look look at the soviet union have that guaranteed free education for even secondary education yeah. if you have the grades you got into university if you want to be a mathematician you want to be a scientist you want to be a rocket scientist a doctor it didn't cost you one penny like you just had to put in the work and, and, and if you had a guaranteed job like if you like it was illegal to be unemployed unless you had a physical disability so you had a job if you got 
like your company went under or something like that, they would retrain you for another job. So you had a guaranteed job, you had a guaranteed apartment or house, you had transportation to and from your place. Yeah, you know, like you said, healthcare, uh, universal education, or I mean, healthcare, which they still have. So all you had to do is be willing to work. The, that was the socialist part of like Russia. And that, like, I agree with all that 100%. I think a lot of people having this guarantee, especially in America, especially during this pandemic, when people are waking up a little bit, like, man, it, I have to go back to work. Right. Because I have a job, but I don't want to get sick, but I'm, but I'm going to get kicked out of my house because I can't pay mortgage. I can't, you know, I can't pay my car payment. That's, that's capitalism, man. I mean, that should wake you up a little bit. If we were, if the United States was not, you know, if the world was not, it was socialistic, it wouldn't meet this pandemic. First of all, it would be over because they wouldn't be sending people out to get sick. They'd let them stay at home, let it pass by, um, you know, let it be done. And then they could go back, but they won't have to worry about rent, worry about this, worry about that. They, you know, be working from home or not working at all. This, you know, whatever, not have to worry about things. But these were the good things about the Soviet Union. The bad things weren't weren't communist. We're not socialistic. The the not being able to travel, the the purges, the um, you know, the restriction on religion, restriction on the, these are not. I mean, that they frustrates me. Like the, this is not Marx. This is not. Yeah has no definition if you look under the definition even the webster's dictionary what socialism and what communism this these are not in there this was a government that took over that was over controlling and like controlled and these had not has nothing to do with socialism has nothing to do with communism and mm-hmm. so when people make i think it's important to make that distinction if like so all socialism is socialism is the people own the means of production and they get the reward they they get the benefit from their from their work that that's all socialism is and like so we're talking about environment talking about like people's rights people having like health care all this stuff that that fits right into that and that's you know able to gives people more opportunities gives them the ability to work and not worry about being like making enough money because you know their kids got to go to college and then they're not gonna have to take out three jobs or get kicked out of their house or get their you know something like that so like these are like important distinctions to make and uh, anyway i'm like going off on tangents but um, no i love yeah. it i love it just keep going <laughs> um but but so so we we got into sort of the um the you actually sort of touched it on it before I even brought it up about the transition from a socialist economy to a capitalist one, because I think this is just one of the most interesting periods of any country in human history. So you have Gorbachev, who sort of goes through this process of reform within the Communist mm-hmm. Party or attempts it. Uh, and, and there's a power vacuum that somehow Boris Yeltsin fills. Um, and then you have uh, you have these these sort of schemes, whether it's uh, the loans for for stock uh, sort of programs, the voucher programs, and and all these very uh, efficient, uh, and not in a good way, but efficient and quick ways of privatizing the the Russian economy as quickly as possible and consolidating it into as few hands as as possible. Could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, it's like, uh, it's the darkest time in Russian history, you know, like, like probably more than, you know, the dark times of World War One and stuff like that. Um, this is when Russia really was sold to um, a few government officials and, and rich and uh, oligarchs and um, Russia has never been the same since, and it's taken a long time to even get back on its feet. Um, there was basically um, thugs running, like you know, like uh, underground mafia, um, like with controlling whole cities at a time, whole like swaths of land and areas and farms and um, manufacturing. Um, oil production, like everything, it was you know a bunch of like either oligarchs and oligarchs, um, like gang members doing this, or 
you know, the other way around. But um, his dark time in, in Russian history has taken a long, just like, like a lot of, like, uh, you know, underground black market stuff. And it took a long, um, you know, a lo uh, along the people for, you know, very kind of roller coaster ride for the last, you know, several years, you know, to get back to, you know, kind of a, like order, you know, where like uh, people kind of respected the, the welfare of other people and respected the law. And um, yeah, it was like uh, going from a socialist to a, a capitalist uh, um, economy is, is uh wow <laughs> it's like yeah. a really it was rough and so like i said it's still the it's not just the remnants of it today there's some big big pieces of it today like some old arcs still in control here some um still you know problems with corruption still a lot of these issues that are that are still rearing their head because of because of this like very short time period so um mm -hmm. it's going to take a long time to fully repair but um you know, hopefully, hopefully it's on the right track. So. Awesome. Well, I think that's a great sort of primer to, you seem to know a lot about the Soviet Union. So I hope we can use you as sort of a resource to understand the history of it and, and the things that went right and wrong in future conversations. Um, so, so I think that's a really good, uh, you know, sort of summary of, of that process. And, and one more thing before you go, um, I know you're, you're, you're fairly busy so i really appreciate you doing with this uh, oh, no, with me. Course, course. and and especially this late i understand it's like 4 a.m there so um <laughs> so i'll and, and and if if you don't want to answer this that's totally fine but so a lot of has been covered in the western media about alexei navalny mm -hmm. i i i really butchered that but um navalny. So yeah. navalny okay so yeah. On one hand, he's sort of he he he's painted as sort of this figure uh, that is under attack against you know more of the establishment of Russia, should we say? Um, but also, you know, there's another way to look at this: is is he seems like a means of Western influence in Russia at the same time, and with it, he sort of seems fairly liberal and you know very open to the West. Uh, how should we on the left in America see that whole situation playing out? Well, so um, the Volney, um, for a couple of years now, he's been attacking like uh, President Putin's like government, basically. Um, not only Pr Putin, he came out with a video like on YouTube, it was like an hour and a half long or something and showing some house in southern russia saying oh look at this it's worth a billion dollars this is where your money's going um pointing out like different um people in russia some of the the people in the duma which is like our congress saying oh look at this person's got money and this is where all this is going it's like so there's so much corruption here like he's a he's a bills himself as an anti-corruption guy he ran for the mayor of moscow um maybe two or three years ago, got like 29% of the vote. And that's, that's his whole, that's his platform. Um, <clears throat> he did like make a comment at the end because there are having some people, um, especially from the bombings in Syria and the Middle East, some, some immigrants come into Russia and his, um, his comment, like his quote is like, oh, we have a, there's a gun, I think an eight millimeter or something like that. And he goes, that's my, that's my solution to that problem. Meaning like, we'll kill these people like coming over. So, um, wow. but his, but his, this is the, this is my, my take on Navalny. So people ask, they have asked me, you know, like, you know, with you, obviously he just, he just got jailed for three years um, for what doing something. Actually, I can't actually even know exactly what he got jailed. And I don't know okay. if it was fair fair or not honestly okay. uh, maybe it wasn't but this guy's whole um his whole thing is fight corruption fight corruption fight corruption fight corruption okay i agree let's fight corruption but he's got no platform he's got no like how are you gonna fight corruption like he wants he wants to be president of russia he wants to be like in the duma he wants to like be in a governmental he didn't want to be mayor but what are you gonna do what are you gonna do during this pandemic what are you going to do about 
the people who lost their houses or lost their apartments with, uh, you know, they had a big like scandal with these apartment builders, like taking money from people and then leaving. Like, like, what are you gonna do about that? What are you gonna do about the homeless problem? What are you gonna do about um, like the, like the, the anything? You know the pandemic, the you know the financial crisis. You need to do about like relations with the United States. We need to do about like relations with China, the, the Ukraine issue. Like this, like he's got zero answers. He doesn't say nothing. He just uh, corruption, corruption, corruption. Hey, he's got to me. He's a joke because he doesn't he doesn't offer anything. He just says I'm going to fight corruption. How are you going to fight corruption? He doesn't even answer how he's going to fight corruption. He just says his whole platform. Yeah, there's people pissed off because the economy is really suffering right now, especially especially during this pandemic. But U.S. sanctions have hurt a lot. This pandemic's hurt a lot. The price of oil being low has hurt a lot. So there's a lot of you know factors going against the economy of Russia right now, and people are people are suffering. Right? People live on on a low amount of money here. Like it's the standard of living is slower than us. Absolutely. And so, you know, people yeah. are like suffering. And so, yeah, they like, here's a guy saying, Hey, we got to fight the corruption. This government has a lot of money. I'm not saying government, like there's not corruption in government. I'm not, you know, but I'm not accusing you. I'm just saying, yeah, of course there's government, there's corruption in government, but what are you going to do about it? Like, you know, my, my solution for him is go, instead of like protests and be angry on the streets and, and kicking over pails and getting people getting arrested, like go do some volunteer stuff, go work with like some nonprofit organizations, go actually help people do, do help. Like if you're so concerned about people's welfare, then go do something to help people get your name out there, you know, talk, you know, politics, get on some political talk shows like I've done. You know, go do some like volunteer work, like help people that actually need help that you that you say you care about and get elected and then work. You know, the best way to fight corruption is not be corrupt. The best way to fight corruption is get friends in the, you know, government. I'm a, I'm a city official here in um, Krasnogor, a big, it's a city right outside of Moscow. And I work with a bunch of people that like with their, we don't have, especially during the pandemic, we don't have a salary, but we're still working for the city, still trying to put um, non like free children's classes together, putting together um, recycling programs. We don't get paid anything for it, but we do it because we care about the people. So I meet other people that want to help out that are doing stuff. And so they're not corrupt because we don't get any money to be corrupt. So this is stuff that I would suggest that Navalny should do and, and then take this to a higher level and be, and then actually have some like layout of a program that he wants to do before, you know, like just saying corruption, 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 go, go do stuff without being corrupt. That, you know what I mean? And then others yeah. will follow your example. You'll get other people like-minded people that want to help people that aren't corrupt. And all of a sudden you've got a movement together of, you know, some government officials that are doing good things for people and there isn't corruption and you're, you're getting what you want. But to me, he's taking the easy way out. He's saying, oh, there's corruption. I would put me in a government, but he's got no experience. He's got, he's never done, as far as I, as I understand, he's never done anything for anybody um, in any level, like helping out, like, or any social work, yep. any programs, any social programs, anything helping people. So like how you elect him into the government, how is he going to help people when he has no experience helping people? You know what I mean? He has, yep. he has experience spying on people, like putting like little like cameras and saying, oh, this person's corrupt. Look, they got a house somewhere. Yeah. That, that's, that's his experience. That doesn't, it, that's not helping anybody. You know what I mean? Right. So anyway, a little long winded, but that's my take on the bone. And this is so, I, I'm just very quickly, I'm so glad you hit on that because there's been this trend in, in Western media, especially where there will be these leaders and that whether it's Guaido in Venezuela, whether it's um, Bolsonaro in the Lava Jato uh, okay. uh, trials in Brazil on yeah. Lula da Silva, yeah. um, they have these sort of, oh, I'm anti-corruption. It, it's this yeah. anti-corruption discourse that is so 
uh, void of any real policy or any real belief in anything that the yeah. only leg they have to stand on is corruption. And most of the time, these corruption charges are just a means of Western influence on these governments. Not that they don't have corruption because most governments yeah. do pretty much every government does, especially a capitalist one. Uh, and because of that, it's, it's very easy for these, for these figures and we need to be very careful on the left of, of, of these figures uh, who, who, who cry corruption when they have no political platform. They, they themselves don't have a, a, an incredibly great uh, track record. And they sort of just use corruption as a means to get the United States or other Western powers to, to delegitimize their government and, and so they can become leader of, of the country. Um, right. and, and it seems like Navalny is is in many ways falling down that same uh, that same path. Um, so I, I yeah. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Can I, so can I want I just want to share like one quick story oh, that like based ahead. on what you're saying. So um, the you know you know the problem in Ukraine obviously. So yep. <laughs> um, so there's two two Eastern republics that consider themselves Russian. Um, broke away from the rest of Ukraine because Ukraine, they had, you know, they had uh, like a coup basically and it orchestrated by the like CIA. It was all over gas, like gas rights and a gas pipeline, all this. So now instead of a, a Russian supported, supporting Ukrainian um, government president, you have a, a Western, like uh, um, you went uh, or uh, sorry, uh, European Union supported supported uh, president um, with a lot of ties to um, white supremacist groups. I might add, but that's the different story. But anyway, so this this politician, this guy, um, this former president of of ukraine what was, was corrupt very corrupt a lot of money all this stuff but anyway the cia like they exposed him and whatever so he got kicked he basically flew out of with a helicopter by the hair of his chin 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 really and right. so there's a big big coup big you know the uh, the maiden and uh so but the eastern part of, of russia didn't want to be part of European Union, didn't pay by the West, so they broke off. So they they broke off into two republics, the Donetsk and Lugansk. So I've been to both, did some seminars, met some people. Uh, anyway, I went to and I went to Lugansk like several times, enough times, and so like I supported the movement to that actually granted me um, citizenship there. So I've been going there, like doing like projects for kids and stuff for a while. Um, so one time I was there. This is probably three years ago i was in lugansk and then went to donetsk um the whole you know the, did the trip did a couple of seminars met with my friends and i come back so on the way back in the airplane i took on a, i think i was on a delta flight and they give you like a newspaper and it was a washington post so i was reading the washington post and in this remember i'd been there like two days before in this, they're talking about the situation where I just left. And they're talking about Lugansk and the Donetsk Republics. And they were describing how armed bands ran the country, how there was a curfew, how like people couldn't speak out because they would be shot. They couldn't speak out, like how things were really were, like um, how they were being, like think their possessions were being taken away by these, like rebels and bands and this affiliated with the like makeshift government they put together and how the, how the, the whole thing was just, the whole place was burning. And I was like, I just was that man. I had right, I'd been there like a half a dozen times already, but now I was just there three days ago and nothing, nothing that was reported in this, this story was true. Like I, like I was, I, I was shocked and, and really angry, like reading this. This, this is the Washington Post, like one of the you know two or three most influential newspapers in the United States, the media. Right. And I'm reading this about, you know, how like Russian troops were there and all that, which is not true. I mean, Russia, Russia like, uh, like whether I get in trouble with this or not, I don't care, that's the truth. Russia did send equipment. Russia did um, 
like how volunteers or whatever, no, no Russian military personnel ever went into Lugansk or Nesk. They just did. They did. They, yeah, they sent some supplies and whatever. Like, but these people wanted to be Russia. They had a referendum, you know, like us, and they they want to be. So they made their own republic um, because they consider they speak Russian. They don't want to be part of the West. Like uh, mm -hmm. they want to be part of Kiev and, and the West of the rest of Ukraine. But anyway, the point is, I read this. I read this report that was nothing like reality. And um, and it's just, it makes you think like if, it, if a newspaper like the Washington Post can make something so um, blatantly, it, it's not, it wasn't even exaggerated. It wasn't like uh, misleading. It was just blatantly, like just not true. Like nothing, nothing in the article um, in this, this story was true. And it was like, this is the people, this is what people in the United States, like it's, it's where they get their information from that, you know, what's going on. Um, you know, I was obviously blaming Russia, blaming these rebels, you know, calling them rebel. I mean, these people just wanted their freedom. I mean, right. I mean, the, the coup happened in Kiev, you know, that's where these people just wanted, wanted their lives back. Yeah. Um, but it's really saying, and, the, and so the, the last part of the story is that the, the people are the ones that suffer because, Right, you, there's Lugansk. I mean, so you have, you know, Eastern Russia. So they have Lugansk. Kind of one, you have this Lugansk Republic, and then across the river that you're into proper Ukraine. And so there was like a bound. There was there's was, there was, uh, security on both sides. Like not only, I mean, they're in a war. You know, not you right. know, it's kind of a ceasefire at this this point. But um, they're not allowed. You know obviously if someone tried to cross you know you get shot but then you paid a bribe of, of equivalent of like four american dollars and they put a little thing in your passport which you get you which is a sticker you take out because you don't want anyone to see it and they let you cross i mean imagine cutting a, a country right in half like on this a very small area like okay the hospital's on this side but the airport's on this side my oh. my my parents live over here but the you know my my brother lives over here you know it's like holy like what do you do so these people were paying these bribes just to go i saw it really sad man there's like a train of people walking across this bridge from this river you know, a bunch with fruits and vegetables like you know because they like trying to make a living because you know they grow it over here but they sell it over here you know coming across every couple of days you know and then four bucks is a lot of money for them especially during this during this war you know so they i mean that's so they have to bring over quite a bit of you know like big barrels something you see out of the 18th century you know people with like big barrels of like fruits and, and vegetables to sell and stuff like that they're, they're just like you know it's like it's brothers and sisters families like torn apart right but like literally like the civil war um it's really sad like to see this and i've kind of the human side of the of the story like something like a washington post or something would never talk about you know yeah. um but it's really and i guess that's one of the things i talk about it, the opportunity to like travel and stuff and like see this like for what it is not just read about it in a newspaper or you know see it or what you see on tv like you see the human the human toll that it takes on both sides you know this isn't yeah. like you know on, on the you know, ukrainian side too these these people you know wow you know they're yeah. they're cut off so it's, it, was, it was really really sad so thank you for adding that human element of it uh the washington post is now owned by jeff bezos so we probably won't be hearing anything human from that uh <laughs> news source for another for a long time yeah. um but but thank you for being this this resource i'm gonna just end the video here or here real quick but but stay on yeah. just for a second yeah. um uh, so, uh, thank you for coming on. Um, thank you for, for, uh, being this resource for us and, and for explaining your career and, and doing this interview with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Yeah.